tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to The Briefing with me, Gloria De Piero. Hope you are enjoying your bank holiday Monday. We're talking Tony Blair and New Labour with Tony Blair's biographer, John Rental. It's 25 years since he came to power. We'll be discussing sexism in Westminster, local elections and mental health support. And my real me interview today is with Conservative MP Andrew Percy, one of the most rebellious Tory MPs. First, it's your news with Rosa. Good afternoon, it's 12 o'clock. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date on GB News. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says the government is not making a real difference on migrant crossings. At least 180 people on six small boats have been intercepted by border force in the English Channel this morning. Yesterday, the Ministry of Defence confirmed that 254 people arrived in seven small boats on Sunday. It follows 11 days without crossings, partly due to strong winds and choppy seas. Sakir says an international coordinated criminal response is now needed. I've worked on international uh, criminal organisations before when I was director of public prosecutions. I know what can be done if you've got teams working together across Europe, all the way along those routes, absolutely bearing down on these criminal gangs and working very closely with the French authorities as well. In Ukraine, Mariupol officials say Russia resumed shelling the besieged steelwork plant as soon as buses carrying civilians had left. President Zelensky said the first group of evacuees are arriving in a Ukrainian-held city today. Footage shows them emerging from the plant's rubble and being led to waiting coaches. One woman said she and her baby had been waiting for two months to be rescued. Former military intelligence officer Frank Lewidge told us the siege in Mariupol will continue for some time. The idea that the Russians have any kind of concern at all for the care and uh, health of non-combatants, and of course they don't. If it suits their purposes, there, there may be some kind of supply. I personally doubt it. That's not the idea of siege. President Putin quite publicly gave the order that not a fly should be getting into the Azovstal complex, and the siege will continue, and it may continue for some time. It will continue essentially till the Azovstal defenders run out of food, water and ammunition. The UK's Ministry of Defence says it's likely that more than a quarter of Russia's battalion tactical groups in Ukraine are now combat ineffective. UK intelligence says it will probably take years for Russia to reconstitute these forces. The Conservative MP Crispin Blunt has announced he'll stand down at the next election. Last month, the former Justice Minister apologised for causing significant upset and concern after he tweeted to show support for an MP who was found guilty of sexually assaulting a 15-year-old boy. Blunt originally claimed the MP Imran Ahmed Khan was the victim of a dreadful miscarriage of justice before then issuing an apology. A senior Conservative is rejecting calls to introduce an all-women shortlist to replace the former MP Neil Parrish. Parrish sparked a by-election in his Tiverton and Honiton constituency after he resigned, having admitted to watching pornography in the Commons. Some Conservatives had suggested that a female candidate should replace him. The Minister for Higher and Further Education, Ms L. Donnellan, told GB News imposing arbitrary quotas does not do women any favours. I find quotas demeaning to women. Women can certainly get there on their own merit. We've seen that with two female prime ministers in my own party. We have a home secretary who's female, a foreign secretary who's female. What we need to be doing is encouraging women to come forward to stand, removing the barriers. 2.7 million people, a record number, have been referred for cancer checks over the last year. NHS data shows the number of patients receiving cancer treatment has risen by 2,000 since the start of the pandemic. The NHS says it's expanded its services diagnostic capabilities with one-stop shops for tests and mobile clinics. The director of the Barts Cancer Centre, Tom Powles, told GB News the NHS needs more staff. Cancer remains our number one killer, will be in the future, and now we have this huge healthcare problem. Do we have the resource to deal with it, which is your question? The human resource we probably don't have right now. The Argentinian ambassador to the UK says the memory of the Falklands Walk is an open wound for his country. Today is the 40th anniversary of the sinking of the Argentinian vessel General Belgrano by the British submarine HMS Conqueror, where 323 people died. 
The Argentinian ambassador says the island's sovereignty is a deeply emotional issue in the country. It's a political as well, you know. Uh, you know, the Malvinas question is the highest priority of my country in foreign policy. Every government has uh, uh, put Malvinas on top of uh, the agenda. And because of that, it's one of the, the main issues in uh, our bilateral relationship with the United Kingdom. You're up to date on GB News. I'll bring you more as it happens. Now, let's head to the briefing with Gloria. Coming up this hour on The Briefing, it's 25 years since Tony Blair swept through the doors of number 10 on the back of a Labour landslide. It's like a very different world. His biographer, John Rental, joins me to discuss what went right, what went wrong, and the state of politics today. And most of us are enjoying the bank holiday and not at work today. But do you know why we get this day off? I'll talk to the General Secretary of the Musicians' Union. My Real Me interview is with Conservative MP for Brig and Ghoul, Andrew Percy. He was briefly a junior minister and compared the experience to a yes minister and the thick of it. He's got a tattoo and a fondness for craft beer. And we're taking the temperature all over the country this week ahead of Thursday's local elections. Today, we're looking at some of the closest races in the country. This weekend, the Labour Party celebrated their 25th anniversary of the landslide election victory, which saw the party get into power for the first time since 1979. But Tony Blair's legacy remains deeply controversial, even within the Labour Party itself. Joining me now is John Rental, chief political commentator of The Independent and Tony Blair's biographer. It's good to see you, John. Happy Bank Holiday Monday and thank you for joining us. <laughs> Happy Tony Blair Day, Gloria. <laughs> right, I want to talk to you about where it all went right and where it all went wrong. But let's start with what I know you'll be bursting to tell me. How did it all go right for Labour back in 1997? <laughs> well, because uh, Tony Blair was an exceptional leader, as you know, uh, and he pursued an exceptionally effective uh, political strategy, which was to persuade the other side's voters uh, to vote for him. Uh, and that is the uh, eternal uh, Blairite truth. And uh, I understand that you know Tony Blair isn't uh, isn't popular with the general public uh, anymore. Uh, but the Blairite truths uh, carry on being true, and uh, the Labour Party is finally showing some signs of uh, of wanting to learn the lessons from the most successful period of its uh, of its existence. And Labour haven't won an election <laughs> since two thousand and five. So what? went wrong we know how they won they won but how do, why did they lose well as uh, as uh, sir tony said himself um the uh, party departed a millimeter from the correct new labor course uh gordon brown was uh, was less new labor than tony blair uh, ed miliband was even less and uh, jeremy corbyn uh, even more so uh, finally we are now back on uh, on on the reverse trajectory, which is that we're getting back to uh, understanding the the lessons of uh, Tony Blair's success uh, and trying to replicate them, and uh, the Labour Party is actually making some progress. The challenges are, are are different, though, aren't they? When Tony Blair was uh, striving for power, he was seeking the votes of Middle England. Today, the Labour Party needs to win the votes of the people it was established uh, for, working class people. It's a very different battleground. Is a, is a North London uh, former lawyer the right man to woo working class Britain? Well, it, is a, it is a different battleground, but the, uh, but the essential principle is the same, that you want to persuade the other side's voters to vote for you. Uh, and it depends where, where they can be harvested in, in greatest number. And yes, it is a problem for the Labour Party that it's lost a lot of its uh, northern strongholds, but it ought to be able to compensate uh, for that by uh, by getting the votes of uh, of younger, highly educated liberals in the in the south and and, and the urban areas. But uh, the the trick is to try and do both, uh, and that was something that Tony Blair was extremely good at, uh, and his successors less so. So the Labour Party used Tony Blair in a party election broadcast, which they, they posted on social media. Was that I did right? Enjoy. As, as you said, 
<laughs> However popular he was back then, not so much now. That's my essay question to you. Well, yes, but I think it's it's symbolic, isn't it? And I don't think that that broadcast is going to uh, is going to win the next election for Labour. But it was symbolic of the change, and it was adding to uh, the message that the Labour Party has put the Corbyn years behind it, uh, and is willing to learn the lessons from its most successful ever period. Uh, and yes, people, a lot of people don't like Tony Blair, but there, there are there are people out there. Uh, who do who do like Tony Blair and, and remember the the New Labour years with affection uh, and uh, and nostalgia and I think it it's useful piece by piece to try and put together uh, that kind of winning coalition again and some of it will include people who thought that uh, that the the Blair years were were good years uh, and have been disillusioned ever since. And while we have you, John, you are a veteran Westminster watcher, one of our finest uh, political analysts and journalists. Uh, the culture in Westminster, this seems to have turned into a debate about whether it is actually a culture or there's just a few bad apples. What do you think? Uh, I, I'm a, well, you know, call me a sunny optimist, but I believe in progress. I think, I think Westminster is much more uh, tolerant, uh, inclusive uh, and, and a better place. Uh, you know, than it used to be. And I think one of the, one of the huge important uh, uh, marks of that progress was the increase in the number of women uh, in, uh, as MPs, which happened in 1997. I mean, there was a step change. I mean, that was absolutely transformative. Uh, and yes, of course, there are going to be uh, men in particular who behave badly, uh, as there are in, in, in all walks of life. But I think it is, it is a much better place than it used to be. Uh, and I hope that, you know, action is taken uh, promptly to, to continue that improvement. I just want to finally ask you about Beergate. Let's give it a gate. The Labour leader says he did not break COVID rules when he was drinking beer with co colleagues last year during uh, the lockdown. He insists he was working. He and his team had only stopped for a break and food before resuming their duties. That sounds very like the Boris Johnson defence. <laughs> is it different? It does. Uh, no, I don't think it is, and I don't really care very much. But then I don't care very much about Boris's cake either. So, uh, but I do think that the problem is much greater for the Prime Minister because it was his legislation. Uh, he broke his own laws. I mean, I know Keir, Keir Starmer supported them and actually wanted the government to, to, to impose stricter uh, restrictions uh, quite a lot of the time. Uh, but it's, it is essentially the Prime Minister who has to take the rack for uh for, for his for his his own laws and for breaking them and you know Keir, Keir Starmer's lucky in the sense that the police decided he didn't break the law whereas the Metropolitan Police in London uh decided that the Prime Minister did uh, and I think that's what most people are going to focus on I think this Tory attempt to try and uh, distract attention is designed to it's designed to put Keir off but I don't think it's going to work. John Rental. It's been a pleasure uh, listening to you. Happy Bank Holiday Monday, or in your own words, have a very happy Tony Blair Day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Cheers, John. Thank you. Now, today is a bank holiday, but do you know what we're actually celebrating? The 1st of May is International Working Day. It commemorates a struggle for workers' rights around the world. Joining me now is Naomi Paul, General Secretary of the Musicians' Union. Lovely to see you. Welcome to the channel. Welcome to the show, Naomi. Thanks for having me. Now, everyone's enjoying their lovely bank holiday. It's recognised as such as International Workers' Day in many countries, but not so much here. Why not? Um, well, I think, the, yeah, May Day's sort of become detached from its original roots, which were about celebrating working people um, and focusing on workers' rights. So um, I think it's a shame that we're not more aware of that. Um, and maybe it's something that the Labour mu movement and trade unions should be working to kind of bring back in the public consciousness. Let's talk about your own union, your General Secretary of the Musicians Union. And when viewers, when all of us think about musicians, we might think about Adele or Ed Sheeran. Presumably you don't represent the massive stars or, or do you? 
Uh, we've got a lot of massive stars in our membership, actually. But um, no, on a day to day basis, we're uh, focusing on um, the rights of working musicians who who need our support and help. So I suppose somebody at Adele's level probably doesn't need the assistance from the union like some of our members who work in orchestras or in the theatre pits in London, um, our members who are music teachers and our gigging musicians who perform in their local pubs and clubs. What's the biggest challenge for your members in the workplace today? Well, like any trade union, I, the big focus really is paying conditions. So um, obviously during the pandemic, all of our members' workplaces just shut down overnight. The live sector just vanished. Um, so our members were in financial hardship during that period of time. Um, now they're back at work, but we've got a cost of living crisis. And a lot of their employers and engagers just don't have the money to give them the pay rise that they need. Um, so we're doing a lot of work around paying conditions at the moment, but also... We're focusing on issues like uh, music streaming, where musicians don't get fair royalties and most of the money goes to the major record labels. Um, we're also looking at uh, music education. So we need to get a fair deal for music teachers and make sure that that's um, a key part of the curriculum. Uh, and we're also tackling sexual harassment in the music industry. You just referred to the culture in Westminster. I think there's a lot of workplaces where there's, that's, there's still a sort of culture that that kind of thing goes on and it's just been accepted in the past and we need a change. And you are the first woman General Secretary of the Musicians Union since the union was founded in 1893. I mean, gosh, if we talk about sexism, perhaps the lack of women, senior women at the head of the trade union movement is, is a stark reminder of it. Well, um, your last interview, we was just talking about how the culture's changed in Westminster now. There have been female uh, people in senior jobs. And I think um, we're seeing that finally in the trade union movement. Traditionally, the trade union movement was really male dominated. And the music industry is also extremely male dominated, particularly in the senior jobs. So I think that it's a really positive sign that I've been elected by our members um, to represent musicians. Hopefully that's the sign of a culture change um, in the trade union movement and in music as well. And let's have a look at more generally trade union membership. Now, the number of trade unionists has climbed over the past four years, but it's still only half of its peak of 13.2 million in 1979. Further to that, private sector workers, it's just 13%. And the lowest paid workers, it's just 10%. It's a problem, isn't it? It is a big problem. And I think we, um, as trade unions, we've got more to do to get across the message that we're still very relevant to working people. Um, and as I mentioned, some of our campaigns around music streaming, um, you wouldn't necessarily associate that with a trade union. Um, but it, again, it just comes down to paying conditions. So I think we've got to try and get the message out to younger people who don't um, associate with the union movement um, and just get across the point that actually this is for everybody. Um, everybody needs the union when times are tough. Um, and, you know, we could all be in that position in our working lives at some point. Um, so, yeah, I still think that trade unions are extremely relevant, probably more so than ever coming out of the pandemic. Um, our membership actually uh, has kind of held up through the pandemic. And I think it is true that musicians have needed us more than ever. Final question, as it is a bank holiday, why do we get so few bank holidays in England and, and Wales, way below uh, the European average? We're just on eight days a year. Well, um, a lot of things are done very well in European countries when it comes to workers' rights, and unfortunately, we've fallen a bit behind. So um, there's a lot of talk now, particularly with people working from home more, about how we could potentially move to a four-day work uh, working week and still be just as productive. So you never know. Uh, maybe we'll end up with some more bank holidays or maybe we'll work, end up with a shorter working week. And I think a lot of people would really welcome that. Naomi Pohl, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show today. Enjoy your bank holiday. Thank you, Naomi Pohl from the Musicians Union. After the break, we will be speaking to James Starkey, former advisor to Priti Patel, amongst other senior members of the government. He's leading a campaign for better mental health treatment. That's after a short break. My name's Tom Harwood and every weekday we bring you The Briefing live from 9.30am. The stories, analysis and live debate that you need to hear. 
quite right, uh, uh, Tom, of, of course. Was this something that had been considered at all? Difficult to answer. Gas guzzling helicopters circling. Noise is being made here. Joe Biden walking out. Thank you very much for joining us. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, Monday to Friday, 9.30 a.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, did you know that according to the mental health charity Mind, 40% of GP appointments are to do with the patient's mental health? Are GPs the right healthcare professionals to be providing this support, or should there be more specialist treatment readily available? James Starkey is a former government advisor and founder of the No Time to Wait campaign, which is calling for urgent action. I'm delighted he joins me now. Hi, James. Hi, thank thank you. you for coming on thank the show. You uh, you're very welcome. Um, you are joining us, of course, on a bank holiday Monday, so we're even more grateful for that. And since we're talking mental health, wouldn't Britain having more bank holidays be good for our mental health? What do you think? Oh, there. Yeah, thanks again for having me on, Gloria. I'm sure it would. I think um, <clears throat> there'll be a lot of people out today spending time with uh, family and hopefully getting good exercise, which is always a great thing, I think, for mental health. And I was looking at uh, your website, which is where I, I saw that extraordinary statistic that we had in the introduction, that 40% of GP appointments are concerned with mental health. W what's going on out there? Well, I think there's a lot. GPs are, are generally speaking, going to be the first port of call um, for mental health. And uh, as you said, we found that statistic uh, from a survey with uh, GPs, which showed just such a high volume of appointments will be about mental health. And that's why the No Time to Wait campaign wants to see mental health nurses in GPs so people can get that help that much quicker and try to reduce some of those waiting times. So I, I read that you want a mental health nurse in every GP surgery. It sounds great. Uh, it's this clearly demand. You used to be a, a government advisor. Have you have the government given you any indication about whether they're going to do that? We've had um, some great conversations with various people in the sector. Um, the Royal College of Nursing are back in the campaign, Mind are back in the campaign, along with other charities like BEAT. Um, and we've also had some initial discussions with um, people in government just to talk them through what the campaign's aiming to do and why. And I think one of the things that I've found speaking to people in government is there is a willingness to listen, 
for things that can help on uh, men- the mental health issue. So it would be a big leap to have a mental health nurse in each GPs immediately. There's <clears throat> clearly workforce issues more broadly in the nursing and the health profession. But one of the things we're hoping to come out with in the next month or two is a pilot scheme which would maybe allow uh, a kind of way into that without having to go the whole leap immediately. And you worked in government for Dominic Raab, Priti Patel, Michael Gove. It's quite an impressive list. But I'm interested in what impact working at such a senior level of government had on on your mental health. Yeah, well, I did. um, I was lucky enough to have those great jobs and... When I launched the campaign, I did one of the things I said, because I mean, it, it's, um, <clears throat> you know, thinking back over it, it's true is when you're struggling with things, and I'm sure there's people in different professions, whether it's journalism, politicians themselves, people in big business, is you think, how can I, how can I be feeling like this when I've got such a great job, when I've got such a great family? And I found that really difficult. And they are high pressure jobs. And I, I, I think, and that's why I put at the time, I think reaching out for help is really, really one of the hardest things. Um, and there's so many people that don't. Um, you know, for example, about two thirds of uh, people over the age of 40, males over the age of 40, who go on to commit suicide, don't come into contact with any kind of help or services at all. And that is that issue of, of people still not reaching out. And I think I'm. I feel so lucky that so many people around Westminster actually reached out and offered their hand of help to me. But asking for that help is a very difficult thing. And would you tell us a bit more about your own personal experience, if if you're comfortable to to do so? Of course, of course, Gloria. Um, I mean, for myself, I had. I think. I've never spoken about it before, so sorry. I I, um, I think it was something that built up over time and that, uh, as I said, for various reasons, I didn't feel like I was able to speak out or go and get the help that really, in the end, I realised I needed. Um, and, and it was once I'd spoken out and spoken to people um, that made the real big change and I was able, and there were, you know, so many people, it was too many to name. <clears throat> and as I said, people are in very, I know there are definitely people in cabinet that really do care about this. And there were so many people during that period um, when I was going through difficulties who were supportive, who tried to, who helped me find help. Um, and that's one of the, re- that's the main reason really I wanted to launch the campaign is I think there are some people who don't have that support network. I'm very, very lucky. And I also found it very difficult to get support on the NHS, which uh, in the end I went um, and now when I require counselling, I I do that privately because it's much quicker and easier. Um, And I think, you know, it's not right that people wait because that is a real danger area. Um, And, you know, the more we can do to get people at an earlier stage before things become so difficult, I think it's better for them. And I think it's I think it's better for society. Thank you, and thank you for for for, for opening up to. Um, if I may, because you were a Westminster advisor, um, I mean the culture at Westminster is really under the spotlight at the moment. It's, it sounds like the Wild West, uh, to be honest. Bullying, watching porn, taking drugs, sexual assault. What's going on? What needs to change? Um, I mean, I think my own experience of Westminster is um, that I think, as John Rental said earlier, you know, there's there's a lot of great people in there. Um, I'm sure things have progressed. I worked, I've only worked in Westminster for the last six or seven years. I think it is a strange culture compared, having spent most of my working life in other areas. It's a very strange culture in the sense that you tend to socialise a lot with people you work with. The hours are odd, you know, you're an MP yourself, you'll know this better than I, but, you know, those kind of strange hours that you're voting late, um, your you're kind of working week is completely different from anyone else's. And I think the way that your social circle and your friends are very much part of your work environment, um, you know, that that's the way that it is. But I think it does make it, it does make it tricky. I, I found... I found it difficult at times. And then when you 
add to that the pressure that exists on various jobs, whether you're a special advisor, um, whether you're an MP, whether you're a journalist, that they are high pressure jobs. You know, I've, d- I've done a few jobs and I'd say it's, it's probably the h- most high pressure I've, I've experienced. And I think if you combine those things, then things can happen. I think the more that can be done from a kind of HR well-being perspective uh, to, ha- to help people and to, and to allow people to have a route to help that they feel confident in, whatever the issue may be, I think that would improve things. James Starkey, I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you today. I hope you come back on the show again soon. Thank you. Thank you. After the break, I've got an exclusive interview with Conservative MP for Brig and Ghoul, Andrew Percy. He's one of the most rebellious Tory MPs, telling me what's the point of getting elected if you can't say what you think. Plus, he talks of his love of craft beers, his tattoo, and converting to Judaism. First, it's the news with Rosie. It's 12.30, good afternoon. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date on GB News. At least 180 people have been intercepted on small boats in the English Channel this morning. Over 250 people arrived in seven small boats on Sunday. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has denied that he broke COVID-19 lockdown rules while in Durham in April last year. Uh, There was no party, there was no breach of the rules, and there's nothing really to add to that. Contrast that with Downing Street, where we know there have been 50 fines issued already in Downing Street in relation to goings on in Downing Street. I think that makes Downing Street the most fined workplace in the whole of the United Kingdom already, and criminal investigations are going on. In Ukraine, Mariupol officials say Russia resumed shelling of the besieged steel plant in the city as soon as buses carrying fleeing civilians had left. Footage shows them emerging from the plant's rubble and being led to waiting coaches. One woman said she and her baby had been waiting for two months to be rescued. A record 2.7 million people have been referred for cancer checks over the last year. NHS data shows the number of patients receiving cancer treatment has risen by 2,000 since the start of the pandemic. Conservative MP Crispin Blunt has announced that he'll stand down at the next election. Last month, the former Justice Minister apologised after he tweeted in support of an MP who was found guilty of sexually assaulting a 15-year-old boy. Blunt originally claimed the MP Imran Ahmed Khan was the victim of a dreadful miscarriage of justice before issuing an apology. You're up to date. We're on your TV online and DAB Plus radio. Shortly, we'll be back to Gloria with the briefing. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions actually. (laughs) That's brazier Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
now for my latest real me. I spoke to one of the most rebellious Tories, Andrew Percy, Conservative MP for Brig and Ghoul. He tells me of his working class background, converting to Judaism, his tattoo and his love of craft beer. Andrew Percy, you grew up in Hull in a normal working class background. Financially, were you comfortable? Um, well, I was quite lucky because when I was young, my parents were both working. My dad was a, a foundry worker for 26 years and my uh, mum was, a, she worked in the local school as a secretary. But uh, my dad lost his job um, when I was about 11 or 12. Um, uh, when he worked in a foundry, he was a boilerplate maker. So obviously all that sort of work at that time was going overseas. So, you know, we had to rely on benefits for a couple of years. My dad struggled to get a new job because once you've, you know, done an apprenticeship and worked for 26 years, uh, I remember he was in his mid 40s by then, which I thought was really old at the time, but now I don't. <laughs> but uh, so we, it, things did get, you know, tight. So we had to, you know, survive on benefits. But my dad always worked, even when he was unemployed. So he did lots of voluntary work and he's quite good with his hands. So he tried to make lots of stuff to, to you know, to, they used to go to car boot sales and sell stuff. But yeah, it was, um, you know, it, it wasn't great for a period. So, you know, I, you know, grew up with my parents really you know, walking in on conversations of, you know, things not being all that great. But, you know, we, he got a job at Alley Market Gardener in the end and did that until he was uh, 70. So, you know, we've never had money in the family. <laughs> so, but yeah, it was pretty, a uh, bit tough for a while. And you were a local councillor by the age of 22, Conservative local councillor. When did you decide you were a Conservative? Well, I think it was growing up in Hull because it was a very Labour town. And my dad had worked in, my dad used to, he, I remember when, my dad, when I was 10, I went and uh, voted with my dad in 1987. And I asked him who he'd voted for. And he said, oh, I voted for Margaret Thatcher. And all I can remember is like, I wouldn't walk back with him because I'd heard at school that, you know, being a Tory was awful. Um, and I was really appalled by this. And then I said to him, like, you know, well, why did you, when I got older, I said, well, you know, why did you vote Conservative. And he said he'd stopped voting, I think, Labour or uh, in the 70s, because he, where he worked, he said the unions just kept bringing them out on strike. And all my dad wanted to do as a young family man with two young kids was just work and earn money. And he never liked the fact that, as he said, you know, the union got bosses used to come down, tell these guys they've got to go out on strike. And then it was him who'd lose money. So he, I think he started voting Liberal, I think he admitted to me recently. Um, and then in the 80s under Thatcher, because it was all the whole buy your own house, you know, um, support, you know, working class. He, you know, they, but my dad, you know, grew up on a council estate in Hull. Um, so it was, you know, first to buy a house, um, that generation. So, um, I, so I always knew that, you know, my family had, you know, were, had become conservative, like sort of proper working class Tories under Thatcher. And growing up in Hull, everything was run by Labour. And I just remember as a kid thinking, well, lots of things don't work very well. Um, so I used to have a paper round. So I started helping the local party as well. So I just often volunteered, not my family are political at all. Um, and then I, you know, just as I've grown up, I, you know, I am centre right. I'm very centrist, but I know I'm on the centre right of politics and I like the idea of aspiration. Uh, and, you know, giving people the tools to do best, uh, you know, the best they can in life. And I, I think that's what I've tried to do in my life and same with my sister. Um, so, yeah, I, but I got elected at 22. Um, but I was actually, I was working in America at the time. Um, I came home and stood in my local ward. There was only one Tory on the council. Um, and I stood and then beat this poor Labour guy. Um, so I had to go back to America, give my job up and then come back. And I did 10 years on the whole council as one of two Tories. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, I resigned just before I got elected to Parliament. But yeah, so I, I kind of became a Tory quite young and just sort of helped the party from then on. Mm. And professionally, you were a teacher? Yeah, I am. Um, so I went to, uh, I, I was first in my family to go to university. So I went to York, not too far away, because I could bring my washing home every two weeks. Um, but um, I, I, I did a politics degree and then I converted it eventually to law. And I always wanted to be a teacher, but I'd, I'd asked if I could do teaching, the teacher training after I'd finished my degree, but I couldn't at that point uh, because of the courses I'd done. Um, but it's after I finished law school, I'd pretty much decided I didn't want to be a lawyer. So I, um, I started teaching unqualified because you could do my, um, uh, I think it was called um, instructoring. Uh, I did that and then I did my PGCE whilst working and, and then taught in Hull for a while, in a, uh, including doing teacher training at my old school or what, what, what was the, uh, what became my old school. Um, and then I was doing primary for a year before I got elected, but I was a secondary history teacher, but I, I did primary just for a year, but I'll never do that again, because I could control 16 year olds 
in Hull, but trying to control five-year-olds was just a nightmare. It was absolutely a completely different job, but I really enjoyed it. And it was good to be teaching in Hull in the sort of schools I'd gone to. So I really enjoyed it. You're an MP, it's a busy job. How do you relax? Um, well, as you know, it's, you know, it's a bit of a mad, because you're never off duty, are you, with this job? It's a weird job in that even when you're sitting at home at 10 or 11 o'clock yeah. at night, you're still you're at work, that. really, because yeah. colleagues are texting you. Yeah. You check Facebook, which is a mistake. Uh, <laughs> you get in an argument with a constituent or you see some casework hasn't been done. You think, oh, yeah. um, so you're never off duty. But um, I like travel, um, but I, uh, I like country music, new country music. I'm really big on that. I go to a lot of country festivals. Um, but I'm really into craft beer, which sounds a bit geeky. Um, but um, I'm in a couple of beer clubs and, you know, we kind of sit together. <laughs> it sounds really sad, but we sit together, we taste the beer, we rate the beer and, you know, we go to breweries, like all these craft breweries. It's, it makes me hip and cool, right? So that's what, you know, all, all the young people are into it. <laughs> so, but yeah, I like, I, I do a lot of craft beer. It's probably not great for my waistline. <laughs> but speaking of being hip and cool, I hear you've got a tattoo. I do, yeah. I got a... <laughs> <laughs> Let's stay up and cool. I do, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, I got it in... Uh, so I worked in Canada years ago and then... Uh, sometime after that, um, uh, in circumstances I won't go into, but I decided to go with a mate and we were both going to get a tattoo. And then he welched on it and, um, uh, and I got one. Um, so I got the maple leaf on my arm. So, so there's a few of us in Parliament, I think, have tattoos. So. But yeah, I ended up getting a tattoo. So. But I might get you need one. your own WhatsApp group. Yeah, we Tattoo should... MP'd WhatsApp group. Yeah, for the cool ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> Probably really uncool now, like, you know... In your mid-40s with a tattoo, I'm not sure, but but it, it looks all right. And I, I do really like tattoos, actually. I like all the tattoo art, so, yeah. But maybe I'll get some more after I've left Parliament, so... <laughs> I do think about getting my majority tattooed on my <laughs> or something. Now, you were a government minister. D did you not like it? Because the reason why I ask it is because you decided to return to the backbenchers after a year or so. Yeah, it was a year. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I... When I came into Parliament, I never really wanted to be a minister. I was never interested in that working your way up because uh, you have to always vote loyally with the party. And I can't do that because I think I'm just, uh, um, you know, naturally a bit rebellious on things. I like, you know, uh, um, uh, it's a bit of a malcontent all the time. Um, so I've always like been quite independently minded. But I, I did it after the Brexit referendum, after Theresa came leave. And I thought, well, those of us who campaigned for Brexit kind of had a responsibility mm. um, to get into government and then you know, put into place the, the, the things we'd been arguing for in that debate. So I took the Northern Powerhouse job, um, but it was at a time when um, the Chancellor at the time, which was Philip Hammond, was about as interested in the Northern Powerhouse as I am in cross-stitching. Um, not that there's anything wrong with cross-stitching, but I just did, wasn't getting any support from the Treasury. It, you know, it'd been very much George Osborne's yes. baby, and I think there was a bit of a anything to do with George Osborne, let's, you know, didn't attract the attention of those at the top at the time. Um, so I did a year of it. We spent the local growth fund. I enjoyed it. It's a great experience, right? Because it was just like, in many ways, um, an episode of um, uh, Yes Minister or um, the thick of it. And so it was a really great experience. I wouldn't say never, ever again, but I just decided that there wasn't any interest. I was offered the same job again. Uh, and I thought, because I wasn't getting the support in Treasury, I just, um, uh, I thought I'd go back to the back benches. So... I decided to do that instead. Um, you mentioned your rebellions. Do you feel guilty when you're voting against your party or is it just now you've done it so many times, is it just <laughs> just another day at work? <laughs> well, there's that little thrill that goes through some, you know, as you go through. <laughs> no, um, so the first time I, I did it was um, after I was elected in 2010 on the tuition fee uh, issue because, you know, I was a kid who got full grant, uh, last, of, last of the, um, I think the last but one year to go to university and get all your tuition paid and get a grant. Yeah. And I knew, like, my parents were very supportive, but neither of them had A-levels or a degree and had never been to university. So it was quite a big jump. And I just remember thinking at the time, um, this might put off working class kids going to university. Actually, all the evidence seems to suggest it hasn't. So I was wrong on that. But I still think there is something about society lumbering you know, you know, generations with this level of debt. Um, so I didn't like the, um, the proposal. So uh, and that was only like after about four or five months. And that was a little bit hair raising because, you know, you knew and it was a big issue, big vote. There a lot of, it was the coalition, there were a lot of Lib Dems. There. So I had to basically hide in the building. I always remember this, my staff were, were ringing me saying like, they're looking for you, the whips are looking for you. So I went and hid down the Lord's end because I was just, you know, I was determined I was gonna vote this way, but as a new MP, a little Scary. bit like, you know, especially when it was one they were very, very... So I was asked to go and see David Cameron, who was, 
you know, I'm quite disappointed. You get all, you know, you know, it's like you get, I'm disappointed in you. You know, you, you're, you know, you're going to go far here, which is what they tell everybody. Uh, if you just, you know, toe the line. Um, so I, I feel a little bit guilty, but I, I actually think, you know, yes, I vote with my party most of the time because I'm a conservative, but we don't want automatons, right? Because you might as well just elect a robot to parliament if they're just going to vote with the party line all the time. Um, so you know, I might rebel this week on an issue. And, you know, I think if I think it's in the interest of my constituents, I'll do that. But at the same time, I understand people, you need ministers and you need, you know, people who are in government have to obviously follow the line. And I don't criticise them for that. But uh, for me, I've just always been a bit of a contrarian, I think. So, and I, you know, and, and I've made the mistake of reading things, right? So, you know, which is what the chief That's said to me That's a terrible mistake. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, the whips. So, I mean, I remember yeah. saying, because this is it's enlightening, because you go, what, what we're voting on? Yeah. You don't need to ask that. That's what yeah. the was. Yeah, yeah ask too many questions. Yeah. I remember one chief whip saying to me when I went in, I said, well, the problem is I went in and listened to the debate and he slammed his hand <laughs> on the table and said, I've been here 25 years. <laughs> I've never made the mistake of listening to a debate in this place. <laughs> I'm sure he was joking, but, but it's like, it's you know, a good you, joke. it's the, um, you know, you, uh, but I think, I think constituents kind of respect you more if you do show a bit of an independent streak. And, you know, and people in my area, it's like it's Yorkshire, North Lincolnshire. We're a bit, you know, bit, yeah. we're a bit rebellious. We're, we, are. We, like to, we like to do things <laughs> a bit differently. So I've, hopefully my constituents have appreciated that. So. And speaking of doing things a bit differently, so you were baptised into the Church of England in 2017. You converted to Judaism. Why? Yes, I was always really interested in um, in the Jewish faith ever since I was a, a kid, and um, there was always some rumor in the family that there was some Jewish ancestry and, and all that. So I was always interested. But it was actually the first time I went to Israel, just after I'd been elected. I felt a really strong connection to the place. Um, I can't really describe it, but it was just really strange. Um, you know, you, you read about people having these connections, and I always think you read it, oh, load of old cobblers and then actually I went and you know I did on on this example so I just became really interested in, in Judaism from then on um always, has a, always had a bit of an interest started doing a lot more family history research and all that um and then just kind of became more and more interested I started attending um services at a local synagogue and then eventually I decided I wanted to convert so I I went through that whole process of uh, of, of converting which um took a couple of years um, a really nice rabbi who, who, who led me through all that and I'm really good friends with now. Um, and I'm really pleased I did because I just kind of do feel, uh, you know, a, 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 a really strong connection with, with the Jewish faith and with, with, uh, you know, with Israel as well, actually. For me, it's, it's also manifested in that of, you know, belief in, in, in the state of Israel and a safe place for Jews. Um, so that's why, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Parliament, you know, supporting Israel and also on anti-Semitism. I currently chair the all party group on that. So it was a really rewarding experience to do. Fascinating. Right. So let's see how straight talking you are on this. Final question. Your party is having a little few bumps in the road on, on, at the moment. You know, some people robustly defend the prime minister. Other, uh, other colleagues stick the boot in a bit. How do you personally deal with the current bumps in the road, shall we call them? Um, look, it's tricky. I mean, it's difficult. And on one hand, I mean, I go back to constitu constituents on this issue and say, particularly on this, this birthday cake situation, in that, you know, I don't defend any of it, but frankly, if anybody in my office at that point had turned up with a birthday cake, it's just we're all so thoughtless in my office that we don't buy each other birthday cakes. I might have thought that, okay, that was probably within the rules because we're all working together anyway. So on that particular example, I, I kind of, I'm not too exercised, but you know, some of the other things you've heard, I, I don't defend one little bit. Um, uh, big issue in my area is the steel industry. And this is what I say to constituents when they contact me on this. Whatever you might think about the shenanigans, the goings on in number 10, the, the truth is the current prime minister, who I did back for the leadership, but this is somebody I also once said I wouldn't put in charge of a duster, let alone the country. So um, when, I, when I went to see him, he did say, well, that's a bit of a problem. I said, well, not for you. It's more for me because I'm the one who said it. Um, <laughs> but I did support him because I thought we had to get Brexit done. And we, you know, having had the you know, period we'd had before, I think that was the right decision. But actually on the steel issue locally, you know, this prime minister has been our biggest defender, supporter, has intervened three times and thousands of jobs in my area depend on that. So when I look at it, I say to constituents, you know, I have to, of course, be cognizant of what people are saying about two years ago, but I've got to think about now, who are the alternatives? And on a big issue like the steel sector, 
you know, where the Prime Minister has intervened to provide hundreds of millions of pounds of support against other parts of government, you know, had to fight other departments of government, Treasury, um, you know, to, <laughs> to, to, for that support, then, you know, there's no doubt that for our area, this Prime Minister is the best Prime Minister we've had for the steel industry. So I kind of try and balance it like that and just explain that to constituents and say, look, the process isn't over yet. I don't know what I'll think if there are more fines or, you know, once we've seen the final Sue Greer report. But at this moment in time, you know, yes, of course, I'm peeved off about some of the things that have been going on that shouldn't have been, even if they, you know, even if you could have technically thought they were mm. allowed. Mm. Um, but then I have to think about the current prime minister is pretty good for my area in terms of the funding we've received and the steel sector. So I try and balance it like that and just explain that to constituents. And for, actually, for, for quite a few of them, they come back and say, well, actually, yeah, I see you're in a difficult position. I get that. Others, of course, just come back with personal abuse. But you'll, you, know, you know that oh, yeah. as well as me. Yeah. Um, and some people you'll never please. But... Um, it is pretty messy, and you know we've. Uh, the, I did go and see the PM for a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and you know said to him, "Look, you've got to sort this out. We can't have this kind of disorder and lack of, you know, clear leadership and professionalism in Number Ten into the future. Um, so you've got to make changes, and some changes were made. They weren't necessarily in line with what I would have liked, but you know, hopefully, there have lessons been learned from this. You can have the straight." Talking stick, definitely, and the straight talking <laughs> award. You. Well, there's no point not, is there? I always say, like, you know, when I first got elected, and you know, people would say, "Well, how do you deal with things?" You know, these questions. So, if you just say what you think, you can't go wrong, can you? And you know, if you say what you think and give an honest answer to stuff, then how can anyone? You know, you can't trip yourself up, can you? Because if you say what's early in your head, and if people don't like it, you say, "Well, I'm just telling you as it is." And if you don't like me, you can pop down the polling station and find someone else to do this job. I just, you know, there's no good of. I can't be doing with all the you know, giving the lines and all that. It's just, what's the point of getting elected if you can't say what you think? Andrew Percy, brilliant stuff. Thank you. Thank you. And you can watch all my Real Me interviews on our YouTube channel or catch them on the Real Me podcast. You can listen on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just search for GB News. Now, on Thursday... Many people will go to the polls in local council elections with the cost of living crisis and Boris Johnson finding himself continuously embroiled in the party gate controversy. Could it hit the Tories in the ballot box? Our London reporter, Alice Porter, looks at three key areas in the capital at this election. Traditionally, London has been red in a sea of blue in the south-east of England, with 21 of London's 33 boroughs currently under Labour's control. But the Lib Dems are defending their stronghold in south-west London, where they have three MPs. They're hoping to increase their three Lib Dem-run councils on Thursday. In 2018, Barnet and Wandsworth voted Conservative. Croydon continued to vote Labour. But could that all change in this election? On May the 5th, people in Croydon will vote in a new mayor for the first time, following a referendum last year. And a key issue dominating the local council elections is Labour's handling of the borough's finances after the council had to declare bankruptcy in 2020. They've been given the money, where's the money gone? You know, it's not them suffering, it's everyone else suffering. And the area's turning into, quite frankly, a dump. You know, and they need to be held accountable. They need to be brought to question. They need to tell everyone openly how they spend that money, who took the money, where did it go, and we need to get it back. But I think we really need to press on, try and shake off that anger and see what we can do to make things better. On the other side of London, Keir Starmer has been out campaigning in Barnet, which has the highest Jewish population in the UK. Labour lost the seat in 2018 under Jeremy Corbyn amidst criticism of the party's handling of anti-Semitism. Daniel Kosky is director of the London Jewish Forum. Yeah, I think we'll see people who previously were historic Labour voters but felt that they couldn't vote for the Labour Party at the last election, feeling like they probably can vote for the Labour Party this time around. But I think what's going to be particularly interesting is are the Labour Party going to be able to win back those Jewish swing voters who at the last election were absolutely not going to vote for the Labour Party, but this time around, can they convince them to vote for the Labour Party if they are, say, unhappy with the government? The Conservatives have held Wandsworth for over 40 years, keeping popular with the lowest average council tax in the country. But political scientist Sir John Curtis says polls suggest they may lose it to Labour. We can anticipate something like two, three percent swing against the Conservatives across London. Nothing very large, 
But if that were to happen, the odds are that would probably be sufficient, given there are a number of marginal wards, uh, for the Conservatives to be unseated. So they're going to have to do bucking the trend once again if they're going to hang on to this borough. After a difficult few weeks for Boris Johnson, Thursday will be the first electoral test to see whether it will impact the Conservatives in the ballot box. Alice Porter, GB News. Time for a few of your views before we go. Kenneth says the whole of Parliament should be investigated to see who is still ripping off the public. Dawn says uh, Bia Starmer has no self-respect, pride or dignity to be able to act so fake and commandeer pious moral high ground in Westminster at Boris when all the time Starmer and Crawley's all knew his own party time truths. Barnes says Blair destabilised the Middle East to this day. The man is a disgrace. Billy says Tony Blair is one of the worst people to serve the people. Just have a poll and you will see. He was a warmonger and destabilised the Middle East and took us into a war, which was nothing to do with us. You have been watching The Briefing with me, Gloria Shapiro. I'm back every Monday to Thursday from noon. I'm even back at three o'clock today with a special local elections debate. Up next, it's On The Money with Liam Halligan. First, it is your bank holiday weather forecast. Looking ahead to today's weather, and the UK is looking rather cloudy to start with some fog. It'll turn brighter, but also showery. Let's get the details. Starting off in the southwest, and this morning's cloud is set to linger until lunchtime for many, with a few spots of drizzly rain. Feeling markedly warmer than yesterday, though. It's also looking mostly cloudy across much of the southeast and around London. It'll be mostly dry, and any early fog should have cleared. It's a different story for Wales. Here the cloud is going to break up, allowing for some sunny breaks, but also a scattering of showers. It's looking similar across many parts of the West Midlands. It'll be brightest for more northern parts with more showers here. Meanwhile, further south, the cloud is set to linger. Coastal parts of northeast England may have some lingering fog as we head through lunchtime and into this afternoon. Inland, things will be brighter, but a greater chance of some showers developing too. Whilst northern areas of Scotland are looking mostly fine with some lengthy bright periods, it will be more showery for central and southern parts, though still some sunny spells. There'll also be a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers across Northern Ireland. Here temperatures are set to reach highs of around 15 Celsius. There'll be further showers as we head through the afternoon, with the cloud in the south breaking up. And that's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. I'm Liam Halligan. Join me every weekday at 1pm for On The Money, your daily dose of economics, business and consumer news. I've got 25 years experience covering economics and finance. We hold grown up discussions with a host of experts who really know their stuff. We can't buy gas and store it. That was a mistake, wasn't it? I think it was a mistake. Even you, Liam, don't have a crystal ball. Inflation's a real threat. Every weekday at 1, you're On The Money. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes & Kerr. Me and my panel will get 